You're listening to Madness, Magic, Mystery. Audiobooks made with AI. Tale 101. Eat Your Vegetables, Part 2. Detective Kelsey woke with a start, bolting upright in an unfamiliar bedroom. The decor of filled ashtrays, stacked books, and magazine piles were replaced by doilies, ceramic dogs, and quilts. Upon hearing a noise at his left, Kelsey snatched the handgun stashed beneath his pillow and pointed it at the unknown assailant. Rather than find a criminal, his partner Henry stirred from his sleep in the twin bed against the opposite wall. Henry? asked Kelsey while lowering his gun and rubbing his face. I almost shot you, kid. Oh, glad you didn't, yawned Henry, who sat up in his own bed dressed in his underclothes. Looking this way and that, Henry frowned and gained the first of many wrinkles on his brow. How did we get here? he asked. Kelsey reached for the journal on the nightstand and flipped through his notes. With every turned page, the seasoned detective tensed. Knowing himself, Kelsey was sure his notes were accurate, and while he could remember some of his scrawlings, many details were foreign. Did you mess with my notebook? asked Kelsey. That old thing? Never, said Henry, who reached for his phone. After rereading his notes, Kelsey grunted and rested his elbows on his knees. We were here for the missing teens, he announced. My notes. I know them to be true, but I, I, I don't remember making them. Smacking his hand to his head, Henry leaned back. The case. The, the Ashford kids. I remember now. Kels, what's going on? Did someone slip us something? Kelsey reached for a cigarette and lit it, taking a long drag. Something in this town, something is making people forget, Kelsey answered, exhaling a cloud of smoke. Opening his journal again, he pored over the details. Frank at the motel didn't remember the teens. Neither did Marla at the bed and breakfast. Is that where we are now? Henry asked pinching the knitted blanket on his bed to inspect it. Clovis, right? Sugarloaf, said Kelsey, running his finger along a line of his notes. We need to call the office. We found the teens, but there's something larger going on here. Henry stood to his feet and paced. This is crazy, Kels. Is it the water? The food? People just don't forget things. I... I I can't even remember what I ate for dinner or what I was doing yesterday morning. Calm down, Henry, said Kelsey. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Does that device of yours work? Henry reached for his phone and held it up. No service. Maybe there's a landline at the desk. The detective dressed and left their room to descend to the first floor. Kelsey rang the dusty bell sitting atop the receptionist's desk three times the chime cutting the silence of the morning. Marla, the innkeeper, bustled from the back room and set a tray of pastries on the counter beside a pot of coffee. Hello there, she greeted, a cheery smile on her cheeks. Do you need a room or are you here for breakfast? I need to make a phone call. Now, it's urgent, Kelsey demanded, cutting to the chase. Henry stepped to the counter, took a pastry in hand, and poured them both cups of coffee without cream or sugar. Oh, Marla breathed. Our phones don't work. Why don't your phones work? Henry repeated, lowering a raspberry danish away from his lips. Tim is supposed to drop by later to fix it, Marla answered, wiping her hands on her apron. Please, feel free to take a seat wherever you find one she said, gesturing to the empty dining area that was next to the lobby. How long has it been out of service? asked Henry. Only a day or so, said Marla. Is there a payphone somewhere? Kelsey asked while reaching for a Blackberry Danish. I can't remember, Marla explained with a shake of her head. 
haven't had my first cup of coffee, I supposed, she added with a nervous chuckle. A photo framed on the counter caught Kelsey's attention. Taking it in hand, he recognized Marla, who posed closely to an unknown man. This here your husband? he asked, showing her the photo. Daryl? Why, yes, we've been married for ten years, she explained. Where is he now? Henry asked between bites of his breakfast, licking the jam from his fingers. Well, he's down by the mill these days, she said, setting out a box of tea and honey. Kelsey wrote in his journal, taking note of Marla's words. Thank you, ma'am, he said, taking his own coffee in hand along with a blackberry danish. You're welcome, boys. Holler if you need anything. Marla said before disappearing into the kitchen once more. The detectives took a seat at a table in the corner beside the window. Kelsey flipped through his notebook and made notes of his notes and then more notes on top of that. Henry raised his cell phone to the air, swiveling his arm like an antenna. Still nothing, he sighed. Kelsey ignored the failed technology. Do you remember what Frank said? He posed while reading his notes. Who's Frank? Henry asked, scratching his head. Wincing at Henry's lapse in memory, Kelsey powered forward to explain his findings. Frank was the worker at the motel. He said his boss Bill was down by the mill too, just like Marla's husband Daryl. You'd know better than me, said Henry, who rubbed his fingers together bridging and unbridging them repeatedly. I can't think of a reason why these men would be down at a mill, said Kelsey. I can't think at all, said Henry. Reaching across the table, Kelsey squeezed the shoulder of his assistant. Stay with me, Henry. We're going to get to the bottom of this and get out. Henry's gaze remained fixed on the mug of coffee in his hands. For both our sakes, I hope you're right. After writing down the directions to the mill from Marla, Kelsey and Henry left the bed and breakfast, stepping out into a warm, sunny day. A little girl stood at the foot of the stairs, her expressionless face framed by uncombed hair. The child smelled of sweat and garbage, her jeans and t-shirt riddled with tears and holes. Kelsey reached for his notebook. Henry knelt to speak with the child. Are you lost? asked Henry, who looked up and down the sidewalk. Where are your parents? The girl looked at Henry, her face the image of innocence. You're not ready for the mill. Why don't you take a walk in the park instead? It's a really nice day. Henry smiled, nodded, and looked up to Kelsey. What do you think, boss? She has a point. It's a nice day, and it wouldn't hurt to get some fresh air. Kelsey almost agreed, but decided to check his notes out of habit. No, he declared, his voice dropping. No, we were going to that mill to investigate. What mill? Henry asked as he stood, rubbing the back of his neck. Son, you're just going to have to trust me on this one, Kelsey said fixing his hat atop his head. I can't explain. He's not ready for you, argued the girl, her voice rising in volume, drawing the attention of the townspeople. Henry, get in the car, Kelsey said, taking note of the reddening faces of the townspeople as they turned one by one to face the detectives. Alarmed by their surroundings, Henry dashed to the driver's side and swung the car door open. Moving past the girl, Kelsey hopped into the passenger side, jumping when the little girl banged against the glass window with tiny fists. You're not ready! She screamed. The car chugged to a start, and the moment the engine allowed, Henry floored the gas and skidded down the main street. Around them, the townspeople broke out into a sprint, chasing. Where are we going, Kels? There's an old mill down by the river, Kelsey explained, 
offering directions as Henry drove. Thick pine of the town's outskirts returned, along with rusted sheriff cars lining the road. Would you look at that, breathed Henry as they passed the leaf-entombed cars. Looks like they tried to set up a blockade. In his journal, Kelsey made note of the cop cars and the angry townspeople. The mill, he repeated, more for his sake than Henry's. We're going to the mill by the river. Right, you said that, affirmed Henry. Or I, I think you said that. Just drive. The mill came into view, a building made of crumbling brick with a large water wheel that creaked and groaned as it turned. The detectives parked their car and stepped out, the sound of the water drowning their footsteps. Kelsey pushed his sleeve to his nose and groaned. Ugh, that smell! This was an odor the detective was all too familiar with. While he couldn't recall why he knew the smell of iron and acid so intimately, he knew what the foul stench was. Death. Both men drew their guns and with slow steps approached the entrance of the dilapidated mill. They were met with a nauseating odor and an incessant buzz of flies. With just one look, each man knew they were about to enter a gruesome scene. Pushing the door open with his shoulder, Kelsey entered the building with Henry behind him with his gun raised, ready to shoot any threat that might present itself. Rather than a threat, the detectives discovered people standing in a line as if purchasing groceries or waiting to speak with a teller. There were men and women alike, some in plain clothes, others in uniform. Each stood limply, their glazed eyes fixed on the back of the head of the person in front of them. Snapping his fingers in front of their dewy faces, Henry noted, They're all brain dead. They're vegetables. Kelsey grunted and continued forward, following the line and the putrid smell of death. What are we even doing here? Henry asked as he followed behind Kelsey. We shouldn't be here. Looking at his journal, Kelsey read through the abbreviated notes of his notes. We need to solve why the town is forgetting everything, he recited looking at the underlined words written in large letters. This isn't right, Henry continued. We shouldn't be here. He's not ready for us. What did you? Kelsey had seconds to dodge before Henry's gun sounded. Are you insane? Kelsey snarled, tackling his partner to the ground and wrestling the gun from Henry's hand. He's not ready for us! Henry screamed, his lips foaming in rage. Looking into Henry's eyes, Kelsey found them unfocused and glazed like those of the people in line beside him. It was clear that Henry was no longer in control of himself. I'm sorry, kid, Kelsey grunted, seconds before his fist cocked back and rammed into Henry's cheek, knocking the young man out cold when his head hit the concrete floor. Shaking his stinging knuckles, Kelsey stumbled to his feet and reached for his journal, reading the entry again and adding notes of Henry's insanity. Taking his gun back in hand, Kelsey shuffled forward. A wave of nausea overwhelmed his senses and the aged detective paused only to surrender his coffee and breakfast to the floor. Looking down, he noted the black substance coating the concrete its content old and sticky. It was blood. Beside him, the line moved, each person taking a few steps to close the distance from the person in front of them. Lifting his chin, Kelsey spotted where the line disappeared through a doorway, a cerulean glow on the faces of those standing in the threshold. Wind shook the walls, the tremble growing as he drew closer to the door. None of the thirty years of his career as detective could have prepared Kelsey for the horror that rested in the back of the factory room. Wedged between the machinery and the wall, in a pool of its own mess, 
sat a hairy creature appearing like a grub before its metamorphosis. Its teeth were lined with the remnants of past meals as it slowly consumed its prey. Obese from overindulging in human flesh, its unsightly form caused the floor beneath it to crack from its weight. Mother of God, whispered Kelsey, who staggered away from the door. The hypnotic antennas protruding from a layer of the creature's fat swayed and brightened their glow. The air between them compressed, blurred, and rippled, the force pushing against Kelsey like a gust of wind. Kelsey's back hit the body of a person in line, and both fell to the ground. Groaning, Kelsey gripped his head, feeling a strong ache between his temples. Standing, Kelsey took in his surroundings, but couldn't fathom how or why he got there. Reaching for his journal, he read his notes and remembered. Looking at the monster in the room, Kelsey swiftly wrote in his journal. Kill the monster in the mill, he read aloud. Sprinting down the hall, he found Henry lying unconscious, his chest rising and falling. Taking his journal in hand, he added the note to ignore Henry and kill the monster in the mill. Stumbling out of the mill, in the distance, he could see the townspeople sprinting towards him, their screams muted by the dense forest. Opening the trunk of his car, Kelsey took in hand his pump-action shotgun along with slugs, slipping them into his bag. Glancing at his journal, Kelsey read, Kill the monster in the mill, and remembered once more. Chanting the words repeatedly, Kelsey sprinted into the mill with his gun in hand, ignoring Henry's body, idly wondering about his safety, but determined to follow through on the words he spoke kill the monster in the mill. Entering the room, Kelsey raised his gun and fired the first slug right into the creature's open mouth. The beast bellowed in agony as the projectiles penetrated the soft flesh of its drooling maw. Kill the monster in the mill, shouted Kelsey, pumping his gun and firing. The antennas glowed again, knocking Kelsey and the line of victims to the floor. Pushing himself up, He glanced at the open page of his journal. Taking his gun back in hand, Kelsey released shot after shot, reloading and emptying his gun even after the creature stopped its wailing and laid still. With his ammo depleted, Kelsey panted, choking on the stench of the creature and the death that surrounded it. It was then he remembered Henry, laying in the hall. Leaving the creature, He returned to his partner, finding the young man sitting up, rubbing his bruised cheek. What happened? asked Henry, his attention straying to the line of townspeople who murmured amongst themselves, their once vacant eyes now filled with confusion and fear. Henry's own eyes were no longer cloudy and returned to their normal mossy hue. Wait! I remember, he continued, looking up at his superior. You punched me. Hard. Come on, kid, grunted Kelsey, helping his partner up, pulling Henry's arm over his shoulders. Leaning against one another, the two shambled from the mill to find a sea of people shuffling around, their hands clutching their foreheads as they tried to orient themselves, their faces a mix of relief and awe. Kelsey could sense they were waiting for some sort of explanation, but he had none to give. He couldn't explain what he'd seen either. All he remembered was that he killed the monster in the mill. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. This story was a lot of fun to do. It really stretched me to embrace mystery and especially like monster murder mystery. And it was a lot of fun to kind of work this together and build the suspense and a lot of great learning lessons, both in writing as well as in recording and mastering audio. I'm not an expert by any means, but I'm getting there and I'm learning. Um, 
If you'd feel so inclined on your way out, do the podcast things or the YouTube things, I think. Like, subscribe, comment. Those really all would help the channel. Next tale will release uh, the week after next. It's a fun one. It's dealing with the consequences of bad choices with the development of medicine and the effects that meds can have. But of course, you know, the bots put their spin on it, so I hope you will take the time to listen to that one too when it comes out. Speaking of the bots, I better go check to see what they're doing in the writing room. That one will come out next week. Thanks for listening again. This is not a bot. Ping you later. Madness. Magic. Mystery. Audiobooks made with AI.